Tiger Panel is going to be around uh, distributed manufacturing, uh, but also uh, the amazing work that um, they've actually uh, jumped on board to help out with COVID-19 solutions. Um, they will tell us more about, about that and what their company is doing. And we'll talk again, same, same format about the trends uh, that they might be seeing in the industry. Um, so we're, we're going to start with uh, Marcelo. And more, what he did at the Media Lab and where he came from and what I've been doing since. And then, uh, and then in particular, focusing on the work that we've done at Form Labs for this sort of last uh, two weeks. Um, so let me just kind of jump straight into it. So. Um, so at the Media Lab, I worked on um, sort of intersection of materials and human computer interaction. Uh, did a lot of work looking at ways to create the sort of computational composites where you combine the sort of electrically active materials with uh, electronics. Um, also did a lot of, lot of work into creating computers that are sort of, sort of small that they can start acting as aggregate materials um, and exploring different kinds of human computer interactions by doing that. Um, when I, when I graduated, um, I continued a lot of the sort of art design work that I was doing. Um, so this is a project where I did something that was sort of very, very small. It was like making these drawings, a bunch of gra grains of sand for uh, artworks. Uh, so this is an example of one of them. Um, all the way to very large things as part of the team that directed the Paralympics and Olympic ceremonies in Rio 2016. So this is um, a bunch of kind of LED, um, animated sort of sticks that kind of you can play around the sort of entire stadium with the performers. Um, and, and right now I, um, I teach in the architecture department, um, faculty there, I teach industrial design, and interaction design. Um, and I'm also head of design of form labs where I spend most of my time worrying about making sure that our products look amazing, but that are also incredibly easy to use. Um, and facilitate the whole process of going from digital to physical. Um, so our products, um, I don't know if people know here, but from lab, so we started um, with a spin-off of the Media Lab. Uh, we make 3D printers, in particular, we started with SLA 3D printer, which is a material, it's a printer that makes physical parts out of a liquid resin. Um, but we don't make just the printers, we make also the software, um, the materials that go with it, so we make sort of an entire ecosystem. And we really focus on making machines that are accessible um, but they have a professional color. So stuff that engineers and professional users want to use and need to use, um, but that are also you know, accessible and affordable. Um, so our, our COVID experience has been pretty insane. So said about like two weeks ago or three weeks ago at this point, um, we very soon realized that we're going to have, um, we're, we're both hearing about, okay, well, we can't be at the office anymore. Uh, and at the same time hearing about, all the sort of shortage of materials and equipment that was happening all over the place. Um, and it became pretty clear to us um, sort of kind of right away that we're strategically positioned to help. Um, we, uh, we have a printer that is made for the medical and the dental world uh, that supports um, a bunch of biocompatible materials. Um, we have customers in the medical space and we know how to operate in that space as well. So, um, and we, we really are in the business of making things on demand. So um, we, we can come up with a design, print it the next day and use it. Um, so um, not only that too, but we also have things like this. So this is form cell. This is basically the a future injection molder. So this is a machine that uh, has an array of printers and it can you know, make hundreds of parts on demand. Um, and we also have a print farm in Ohio. So we actually have 250 3D printers that are ready to print parts as, as we need them. Um, so as we started figuring out how can we help, what's, what's the problem here? Um, we identified sort of three kind of uh, approaches or ways of sort of looking at this that we should um, take into account. So one was a kind of clinical demand. Uh, we know what is it that doctors actually need, uh, doctors and clinicians. Uh, technical feasibility. What is it that we can make here that will have an impact that's both feasible but also scalable? Um, do, maybe just one thing wouldn't be enough. Um, and things that have, um, what are the regulatory implications of what we're doing? Right? Are there things here that we that we can do and we can get it out there? Or are there things that we shouldn't be doing because maybe they'll do more harm than, than actually help people? Um, and sort of three initiatives kind of jumped um, immediately. So one was doing uh, working on test kits uh, and kind of detection. The other one is working on masks, masks uh, for prevention. And then um, 
the third one is working on ventilators for helping patients recover. Um, so I'm going to go through some of these uh, briefly, and then we can can answer more questions afterwards. So um, for the test kits, we worked with the USF Health um, Hospitals um, in Northwell as well, and Florida, and to develop these little swabs. It's basically kind of a little plastic stick uh, with a break point that can be inserted into your nose and removed um, for a sample collection so they can test to make sure that if somebody is, in, is infected or not. Um, and we're incredibly sh in short supply of those. Um, so we've worked with them to create a design very quickly. This is, I think to me, this is sort of the, the, the kind of craziness and magic of what has happened in uh, the last few weeks is that we went from a problem to scaling something to like potentially millions of parts in two weeks. And I've never heard of a product development cycle like this ever. Um, it's pretty impressive and it's pretty amazing. Um, so these are some of our um, cure machines, uh, curing the swabs so we can uh, package them for shipping. Um, and this is a little, uh, this is a package that you can put the swabs in and put into an autoclave for um, sterilization. And the sterilization part happens at the hospitals when they receive it. Um, the other effort that we're helping is this one. So this is making a uh, snorkel mask adapters. Um, so there's a team called Mask On that have been working with physicians here in Boston to basically create, you can see on this photo. So this is a snorkel mask at the top of it. There is uh, this little adapter that connects to kind of a generic filter that you find in a hospital kind of breathing circuits. And that basically extends the ability of using more filters and um, also using a mask that's kind of sort of full compliant to the face and it really protects physicians. Um, this is Alex testing the, some of the first tests and prototypes that we're doing. Uh, those, those guys are the real he heroes in the story. They, um, we've been working on daily kind of testing designs, uh, 3D printing, making changes in it over and over again until we get this right. Um, and um, we, we're now started scaling this. So uh, we've been printing um, like hundreds of these already uh, and starting to assemble them together. Uh, we we'll probably have, you know, uh, and I say we, I'm talking about MassCon in this case, we're working with them. Um, it's a sort of a self-organized group of engineers that are local. And they've probably bought the entire supply of snorkel masks, the entire planet at this point, I think. Um, and then the final one are ventilator splitters. Uh, this is an option that we're still looking into, uh, but there are physicians um, around the country that are using our products um, to create ventilator splitters. There's some debate in the right now if that, that's a good idea or not. There's some risks to doing this. It's not a really proven technique, but I, I think people are getting really desperate and they're kind of resorting to the solutions. Um, and yeah, so this is what they look. They basically allow um, several patients to use a single ventilator so we can sort of double or triple capacity in that sense. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of stuff happening and it's all moving super fast. Um, I think that the amazing part of all of this is that we got a lot of, um, we got reached out by a lot of our customers, but everybody wants to help. Um, so if you have any questions or, or wanna help or have any information that can help us, go to the site and um, enter information there and reach out. Thank you, Marcelo. And, and I'm done. Yeah, thank you, Marcelo. This is great. Um, and and it's, it's actually um, extremely inspiring and impressive to see um, the MindyLab community jump on board uh, on a number of different projects, the swabs, the shortage of swabs, the shortage in um, masks, PPEs with Brigham and women. Uh, and, and it's also on this particular call, we have you know, uh, three companies who actually are jumped on board. And, and next after, uh, Marcelo, I'd like to ask for uh, uh, Ronnie, uh, to join in, uh, and Ronnie, um, you know, from Tulip, who uh, many of you know, has been also empowering, um, you know, the underlying um, uh, tool that have been making all of this possible at scale. Um, so, Ronnie, uh, to you. All right, can uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Question one. Yes. All right, can you see my screen? Question two. Perfect. All right, great. Um, so let me kick this guy off. Um, so actually, I'm really glad uh, to be to be following on Marcel because his uh, work is uh, directly related to it. Um, so uh, I'm Ronnie. I'm uh, uh, co-founder and CTO of Tulip. We are um, a spinoff from the Media Lab, about five five years old. Uh, 
the I'm going to go fast through this. Uh, many of you already already know us. Basically, we are a uh, software company for supporting the manufacturing industry. Um, and what that means is we make a tool for manufacturing engineers to create uh, their own applications for the shop floor. Um, it's, a, it's a no code environment. You can build logic and, uh, and like into these applications. These applications are connected to the physical world um, and to different uh, existing IT systems within the manufacturing environment. Um, and the execution of these applications lead to uh, different forms of analyses that allow you to uh, optimize the system and basically close a, a feedback loop. Um, uh, so I could talk at length about that, but uh, focusing on our work within the manufacturing community uh, during the current crisis, there are two, two key things um, that we're doing. One is that uh, you know if you are a manufacturer who is doing anything in related to uh, COVID-19 mitigation or PPE or the like, we want to help uh, and basically provide um, tool support both in terms of software licenses as our team in order to um, help in the deployment of that in ways to scale uh, scale effectively. Uh, there are a couple of things we want to talk about um, that are sort of examples of things that we are we are currently working on. So um, one of them, the this is the same deck that Marcel with masks on to build these uh, adapts um, for snow masks um, as a durable form of personal protective gear, um, it, given the current uh, shortages of uh, N95 masks. Um, what's uh, interesting about this uh, in particular, they're also, uh, I'll show you here, they're also working on, um, on face shields as another example of something, uh, components that can be uh, 3D printed and then distributed. The, the tricky thing is, is that now this grassroots effort has um, you know, brought together uh, companies and individuals uh, throughout the United States. But how do you manage this uh, entire distributed manufacturing process, supply chain and distribution uh, from when you sort of have nothing to, to, to start from? Uh, and this is really a logistically challenging problem. What you're seeing here, this is uh, in an office here uh, in the seaport, or I believe this may be in, in all life here in Boston. Of This is on the order of a thousand of these masks uh, ready for production, assembly, test, and then finally uh, distribution. Um, so kind of what you have is, uh, you know, this is a, a group that had uh, effectively zero IT to be able to handle all of this and get from the combination of the off-the-shelf components, the masks themselves, the uh, 3D printed components. So these are the adapters that fit onto the, the end of the snorkel and then connect to uh, hospital standard um, fil filtration. Um, connect those into an assembly process with, uh, connect those with volunteer couriers um, to bring them to the assembly centers where you do a QA, you have a traceability of, uh, of, of these equipment that's get made. And then finally connect them to the demand side and courier them to clinicians um, in, in need. Um, so this system, uh, you know, uh, a real shout out to uh, my team and especially uh, Mark Friedman who basically did not sleep for four days um, and uh, built out a full, basically built an ERP and Uber in, in Tulip over the course of, uh, over those four days. Um, and this is a combination of different applications, uh, mobile applications that are used by couriers, uh, a, a tool for kind of the master distributor or, or coordinator, um, as well as on the line um, uh, applications for the, uh, set, you know, final uh, final assembly where you're you know creating a serial number that's going to be attached to these um, uh, to these to these products, um, and then getting them uh, out the door to uh, to to the clinicians who who are in need. Um, so, kind of like as a as a high level overview, this is kind of like a level of the sets of applications and integrations that um, are are tied in here because you have 
um, other you know, web forms that clinicians are using to you know, generate the demand, um, then these orders are getting distributed, et cetera, um, and, then, and then finally shipped out. So uh, it was actually today that the first product was delivered end to end with Tulip. This was a set of uh, face shields uh, made in New York and distributed to uh, uh, via courier to a local uh, New York hospital. Um, and we are assembling uh, today um, here in Boston, um, a large batch of these thousand uh, devices uh, for distribution, uh, both locally and uh, in and to New York and, and other places. Um, so that's one kind of category. The second category of applications we built out is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, we're calling it uh, Corona Gate. It's basically a tool that can be used by uh, a facility, either a manufacturer in a, uh, or uh, a nursing home or the, or the like to be able to track uh, entry into the facility uh, via a combination of additional hardware to do non-invasive temperature monitoring um, and a set of quest questions for, uh, for the employees that can be also done, uh, used remotely before they come into the, uh, to the office or to the facility to track uh, population density and whether or not they should even uh, come in based off of uh, uh, social distancing uh, requirements and the, uh, what the facility is capable of, uh, of holding. Um, and so like, likewise, here's another uh, element of, uh, of this application um, where it's actually at the gate uh, uh, temperature screen that, that occurs at the, the entrance. We had earlier versions of this uh, which also included all sorts of uh, uh, tracking of travel and making sure uh, that you, if there was any outbreaks in places that you had traveled to, that is uh, no longer relevant now that it's everywhere, unfortunately. Um, but if you are a manufacturer and if you uh, are involved in any kind of efforts here, please uh, email us, we, would, we really would like to, to help. Thank you, Ronnie. <clears throat> it's awesome as well to see um, how fast the team has jumped on board and built solutions. Obviously, leveraging technologies that we've been working on, thinking about for a long, long time. It's awesome to see that, and it's um, you know, it's it's one of the key secret weapons of startups being nimble and pivot and really find opportunities. And in this particular case, a big part of the solution uh, versus re relying on waiting on big uh, supply chains and big. Uh, and you guys are have jumped on board very quickly. We have a bunch of questions for you as well, Ronnie. But first, we'll, we'll last actually, but not least, we'll go to GFA and hear what OBT is up to and what they're doing also in part of the response to COVID. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, GFA. Yeah. All right. Uh, so um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Oops. Hold on a second. To share. Share screen first. All right, I think you should be there. Okay, so uh, I'm Jifa, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of OPD Industries. We are a uh, Yarn Lean startup uh, uh, here in Cambridge. So our specialty is basically uh, uh, building a 3D printing system specifically for uh, materials and product that requires a very fine, uh, intricate uh, microstructures. So as you can see from the left images, we build you know, tiny lattices, uh, fabrics, and uh, uh, synthetic fur or feather structures uh, for different products across different industries. And um, so, uh, yeah, that's basically a, a little bit about what we do, um, and we so for this whole, uh, for the whole uh, uh, COVID nineteen emergency thing, uh, we actually so this is actually a timeline how we got involved and how the things been developed. So uh, we've been helping uh, to develop the three D printed um, uh, nasal swab, and as Formlabs Labs mentioned uh, uh, earlier, so uh, we're also. Um, uh, um, um, basically making parallel effort on that. So we got a, a design brief uh, from uh, Beth Israel Hospital uh, on 20th, which is uh, last, last Friday. 
And basically they were saying like, oh, I heard you guys uh, 3D printing tiny fur and now we're running out of the swaps. And then those flock swap has, you know, also tiny fur on the tip. Uh, would you guys be able to help to develop it, something like that similar? So we got that design brief and then quickly come up with a, 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 a few design iterations and I sent it to them next day. And those tests, uh, and then all the designs basically uh, being tested about their collection sufficiency and the PCR, which is like to show that you, uh, the, the swap that you're 3D printing will not pre um, prevent the uh, RNA synthesize um, during, you know, when they collect the, 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 the samples from a patient's uh, nose. So we basically like, this is a very promising and quick result to show that, hey, actually 3D printing can also basically um, be helpful on uh, those kind of medical devices. So uh, uh, that was very encouraging to get a positive testing result. So we basically keep on going, improving the design. And then and, and by you know, uh, uh, this Monday, we also received the, uh, you know, a green light from FDA, uh, the company and the product is listed at the FDA. And uh, yesterday we actually just, uh, the, we also basically sent our um, uh, swaps to autoclaving test, which means the, the swap can be properly uh, sterilized and fully sterilized, including the package um, and, bef uh, and before delivering to the uh, uh, hospitals, to the, to the clinician's hand. So, 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 so right now we are at the stage where basically shipping a bunch of samples to uh, hospitals or organizations that request and at the different states. And right now we're basically just working on how to scale up our um, capability. And so, yeah, so this is an image of how the, the swap look like. As you can see, this has a bunch of like a, this tiny first that um, actually helps to uh, collect the, 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 the fluid and also the uh, bacteria and also the, the viral particles that can be trapped in those microstructures. And uh, um, uh, we basically follow the design criteria that's suggested by the doctor, the length and also the breaking point. Um, and, 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 and so, so that, you know, like this is a, something that we can, you know, it's not a completely a, a new invention for 3D printing, but more really like how we can use the 3D printing to sort of like get jumping in those emergency cases. Um, and, and yeah, so we did some, uh, also some quantitative tests at MIT Center for Bits and Adam and we're looking at how much, you know, compared to the normal cotton swab, how much uh, is it performing equivalent or it perform uh, worse than the uh, normal cotton swab and to what our surprise is like, you know, those microstructure actually really helps the absorbance of the, of the, of the, of the sample that you, you know, when you're sticking people to throat or people's nose and, and that actually, you know, perform pretty much equivalent as the cotton swab. But the surprising thing is that also the releasing of the of the sample is much faster and much higher than the cotton swab. So this is very something very promising. And then we would like to basically, you know, like keep, you know, uh, uh, getting more feedback from the clinicians on that on that on that end as well. So. Um, now we are basically, so, so at the OPT, we build our own uh, hardware and software for this kind of like a, a printing uh, a request. And right now uh, we have our own machine that can build up to uh, 4,000 swaps um, a day. And, uh, and uh, right now we are basically looking at how to quickly ramp up this to 20 or even more machine to meet the urgent demand right now, like across the nation. And we're also uh, looking for, you know, any help that we can get in order to distribute those swaps to the place it's needed. And uh, yeah, I think that will be my quick three minutes explanation of what we're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Jifei. And I think many, many of the people watching uh, know your work when you were um, at Tangible Media with Professor Hiroshi Ishii and working on, on the Celia project and uh, moving from the feather or head like structure from your fashion, fashion uh, product, fashion work that to showcase the uh, power of the technology and now moving uh, very quickly to, fight, to fill in a, a, a problem. But just to clarify one point you mentioned, you said 4,000 uh, swabs a day, that's per machine, correct? Yes, that's per machine, yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Jifei, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll move to the to the question part of the of the of the session, and I'll I'll have Calvin kick us off with the first question. Thanks, everyone, for sharing a very inspiring um, and exciting, um, and amazing that you were able to accomplish so much in just a short order of a couple of weeks. But through this process, I was wondering, what do you think are some of the maybe stress points or bottlenecks, maybe the opportunities for most improvement? through this uh, manufacturing that you've experienced in these couple of short weeks? Um, I can maybe jump in quickly. Um, 
human communication, I think, was the biggest bottleneck. Um, I think that the the immediate thing that I that we saw was there were a lot of people wanted to help. They're all jumping to Slack channels and trying to pitch in, trying to help, charge different things, and that became immediate chaos that basically brought in the effort to halt. Um, and as soon as people started breaking up into smaller groups and sort of organizing in a better way, then then stuff started happening. So I think that the right now, um, and it's it's, it's, a, it's actually interesting, right? It's, it's the media lab. We can solve this problem. Um, we don't have good tools to design in, in groups of you know thousands of people to solve these large scale problems. And I guess this is where also a tool like Tulip, uh, which came in later on as well, could help a lot with normalizing that communication. Yeah. Is that right, Crony? Can you speak a bit to that and how you and how you see Tulip solving or being part of the solution there? Yeah. So I want to echo Marcelo here. I felt like. Uh, you know, things really kicked off in the last several weeks. It's like the most global networking extravaganza I've ever been part of, right? Where everybody wants to connect to everybody uh, right now to do something. Uh, and it's great to see like uh, so much energy and, and volunteer for it. Um, so we're also part of the Massachusetts Manufacturing uh, Emergency Response Team, uh, which is uh, group out of Mass Tech uh, coming, uh, you know, uh, coming out of the st state of Mass to try to connect manufacturers, uh, might be transforming their operations uh, to do something that they've never done before um, to be able to support um, uh, 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 the medical community. Um, and one of the the you know the challenges for the manufacturers is like you, if you haven't ever built something uh, like whatever it is that you're gonna start building and you're starting from scratch, how do you transfer the the knowledge um, to to other other folks, other manufacturers? Um, we hope that um, you know we could be uh, a place to leverage that and take different designs that have been you know open licensed and the like and uh, and share them more broadly as a kind of communications platform for doing that in a controlled manner. So all the uh, you know standard requirements that you have over uh, control and approval paths and and things like. That. Um, but be able to do that you know, remotely because, you know, typically when you're, if you're using a contract manufacturer, um, your engineers are going to be spending time on the floor of the contract manufacturer, getting that product uh, up, up to speed. Uh, and that's a lot harder now. Um, and it's a lot harder if you're trying to do this simultaneously, potentially in multiple manufacturers. Does that point to basically uh you know, I think consolidation of the value chain of, of in, in these kind of stress points where the, the doers, um, you know, and have to be much closer to the distributors, much closer to the regulators, much closer to everyone else in the value chain to, to, from designing to, to, to actually shipping. Does that mean that does that point to a, uh, either a closer, tighter collaboration that is needed or coalitions being formed that will persist or perhaps companies trying to, uh, you know, move a bit into different spaces that they would actually be able to do either side of, of where they are. Yeah, I think well, the things like regulations that you bring up is like something that is it's a moving target um, daily. Uh, you know, uh, FDA is approving new emergency um, uh, grants, basically, and new new measures to. Uh, speed the process by which we're getting stuff to market. And I think that, you know, going back to kind of the communications tools uh, there, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing, for example, at the Mass ERT is there's like a dedicated group that's tracking all of these and helping to push all that regulatory information out to manufacturers that, you know, may not have that effectively natively within their, their organization. I think though that, and I'm, not a real, uh, uh, I'm not a great student of history in this, in this regards, but the, we've done this before in America, uh, you know, in the Second World War, where we transformed uh, manufacturing companies from building one good to another good uh, effectively overnight. Um, and I, there, there, I, no doubt there are lessons to be learned there. And I just, 
I'm not the one to be able to know what those lessons are at this point. Yeah, I'm going to shift actually to Jifei since he actually falls into that category. Obviously, a much younger startup, uh, you're just about fig trying to figure out your product market fit. You build the science and then you find this opportunity to, to, to support and, and make an impact. Um, tell us more about that process of how you as a founder CEO of a young company decided to jump on this uh, and, and kind of how you're weighing, um, you know, how you're thinking about potentially, you know, the future of the company. Uh, I know it's, it's quite early to talk about that, but, you know, comment on that if you can. Uh, and then also on the shift that, uh, you know, the, 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 at least a temporary pivot, temporary focus that, that you're putting on right now. Yeah, um, I think, you know, like to be honest, Habib, I think, you know, because everything happens so fast and I, I, you know, I haven't got a really time to really reflect, you know, the whole experience thing. But some quick thought is that um, I do think when we first, because, you know, like in the very beginning when the, when the emergency happens, right, like uh, internally, we also talk about, you know, we are a 3D printing company, you know, you know, the, the, the power of 3D printing is, you know, manufacture on demand. Can we actually do something about it? And uh, can we basically print, you know, like a, a face shield or some other things that can help with the, with the, with the personal PPE thing, right? It's like, it's, but, but it seems like a pretty, um, uh, we are doing the 3D printing, but we're actually pretty specialized on one direction of the 3D printing, which is more like a fabric textile, like 3D printing. So it's kind of like a not a quite fit. So we were very hesitant to jump in on, on that as much as we really, really want to. Um, but then like, you know, when we got a request from Beth Israel and talking about swap and then that's, and then, you know, specifically looking at how this kind of like a small, uh, tiny structure can provide, you know, like a similar uh, uh, performance of, of the normal swaps. And then we're like, hey, this is actually might be something that we can help with that utilize our, you know, like uh, expertise and know how in terms of like a 3D printing microstructures. And, you know, that's that's why we decided, you know, like this is definitely, you know, fall into our category that we, we you know, we definitely need to and should um, help out with this situation. And I think, you know, uh, right now I, you know, I have not yet really thinking about it for a really, really long time. Are we going to become a completely, you know, 3D printing medical devices company from that perspective? But I think, I do think, you know, this, uh, um, this whole process, like, got me thinking, you, you know, it's like, I think of finding the, this right product market fit, it's like, um, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it when it, it just really provide a very unique opportunity to, to let us know that, you know, our technology can be also used for the swap printing. And before that, we would never really think about uh, that would be the way, yeah. That's great. And it's also very inspiring that you moved on that very quickly, especially the, the young company. We, we're seeing the, uh, bigger companies also do that shift. Uh, New Balance with building masks and Tesla with ventilators. So it's not just young companies that are jumping on board, but obviously with bigger companies, it might be tougher to think about that, about the, all, all that's involved. Uh, and ha we have one last question and then we'll wrap up. Um, the question I ask is just, uh, you know, what is an industry behavior that is, you're seeing right now change in the manufacturing world that you think will persist post-pandemic? Post and whoever wants to jump on it first, feel free to do that. Um, I can maybe start. Um, I think I think one of them is this idea that you need. I mean, so so I think there are many things right that sort of got challenged. One is the idea they need a factor in the first place. Um, I think that we what you've seen is like people jumping from all over the place with their own printers ready to make things. Uh, if we create the technologies to engage everybody and enable everybody, then they, the way that we think about manufacturing will completely change. Um, you know, you can send designs, share designs, print a test, a prototype, and I think that that will completely change the, the ecosystem of how it work. Um, and it, it's been it's been pretty amazing to see from Labs customers engage that way, and I think that they will continue to see that moving forward. Thanks, Master. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I, I, I think, you know, I think that after this, maybe one of the things that people would definitely rethink about is this uh, idea of the efficiency and the, re the resilience, right? I think right now we all basically, uh, the whole manufacturing industry is built on this paradigm of higher efficiency. But basically higher efficiency means that, you know, it's definitely lower, it's, it's gonna be a lower resilience. So, so, so right now, you know, because this whole cycle demand and, uh, and the supply uh, cycle is so long uh, 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 with the mass production so that, you know, for things, things as simple as swap, right? 
like every year, this uh, the, a swap company probably will basically fix producing at a certain amount, not because they cannot produce more, but because if they produce more, there will not be demand. But when things like this emergency happens, there's a spike of the demand, how the manufacturing can be more resilient and responding uh, rather than just maximizing for the efficiency. And I think that that will be definitely something the industry uh, will think about more uh, even after this pandemic. Yeah, and to comp to complement those uh, those great comments, I'd say that there is a you know a place for kind of systems for a, a, a marketplace to connect these distributed manu manufacturers um, from you know ways to maintain uh, quality and um, and the like, so that as an end customer, you really don't have any idea if it's coming from a factory next door to you or from across the world. You're going to get uh, the same the same quality goods yeah like even, even the idea of like a national stockpile right now seems crazy it's like why do we have a stockpile this seems this seems like a problem we should have it everywhere everybody should be able to scale up what they need um and i, and I, I keep thinking that like in the future in, in the future i mean like next month i think every hospital should start building their own 3d printing manufacturing lab so they can scale things as they need Sorry, that, that, thank you very much for that. Uh, Calvin, you wanna wrap, wrap us up? Well, uh, thanks everyone for sharing. Um, it was um, really inspiring to hear how everyone has really jumped in to respond to this um, global crisis and to find um, the resources and the time and the energy to just pitch in any way that they can. Um, just like to invite anyone who's on the stream or in the chat or in Slido to reach out to any of the companies or to reach out to Habib and me if there's additional information you'd like to find out, if you'd like to engage and like to contribute in any way. Thanks. And, and, and as a reminder, this is the first E14 Live of many series that we'll be holding future uh, future conversations like these with other kinds of companies covering different topics. So if you have feedback as well that you'd like to share with us, send it to us or to the Media Lab team as well. Thank you very much, and we're logging off. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks.